continue in our study on uh, offending people. And uh, we are going to this uh, in this light of the problem we have nowadays because of people being offended. What do you do when you get offended? That's what we're talking about. Uh, so if you are just now tuning in on this one, go back to part one. Um, and what's that? Happen? Well, probably not happen, but watch that first and that way it dovetails better. Uh, but so because people are not saved, that's when, uh, and not Holy Spirit built, they don't know how to deal with a problem. Um, and so it'll be sort of temporary, <coughs> not long lasting. Um, so, um, as I was saying, that people are dying more from the sin virus than from the Wuhan virus. Uh, incidentally, Wuhan virus, if you look at it with a microscope, if you zoom in really, really close, you'll see on the Wuhan virus uh, little cells that says made in China. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, probably figured somebody. Uh, but anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, so in this verse, uh, Matthew 18, 15, uh, gives us the formula on how you deal with offenses. Um, so we'll get you to read that one verse there. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Okay, so here's, here's how you deal with <coughs> conflict, offenses. Um, somebody offends you, you go to that person and tell them, this is what you said, or this is what you did, um, and I was offended. And uh, I just, all I expect is an apology or whatever. So, uh, and it says, <coughs> after you conf uh, confront the person, you know, go humbly, not haughty, as I mentioned before, uh, and if the offender hear you, or in other words, admits his fault, uh, then, you know, you can restore the relationship. Um, but I notice that the offended person is to go and talk to the person who offended him. Uh, don't go to Facebook, don't go to the phone, don't go to Messenger and say, uh, Joe Blow said this to me and I was really offended. What do you think? Oh, poor baby. Oh, um, yeah, Joe Blow said this to me. Oh, that's really terrible. I'll be sure to post it on my Facebook, but this Joe Blow is a really bad person. Uh, and so you gather all these people to be your little uh, uh, troops, so to speak, to go in. Everybody's going to come against them <clears throat> and, and really make them feel bad. No. Um, no, but that's oftentimes what happens. Facebook, primarily, is uh, like a big uh, gossip board. You know, uh, everyone's probably have somebody who's offended in something that they didn't, uh, quote unquote, think they got a fair deal with our business. Um, and what they do is, well, uh, they're a real kind of person. Like, oh, can you do this and that? Which basically, um, we're not obliged to because it's, say, out of warranty or whatever. But they'll, they'll say, oh, oh, you're not going to do that? Well, I'm going to go uh, write a bad review on you. How many people have that happen? Businesses get a bunch of people. And they won't come back and say, you know, I've got a great deal. They'll just go on there, rant and rave. So, uh, what the proper channel is, of course, yeah, as you say, well, they did come to you. Uh, but the second part is, uh, when you yourself go to all these other places and, and post a big complaint and all like that, then you become in violation of God's word because you're not going through this formula. Matthew 18 shows. Um, so, basically, you're losing your standing against that person with God because you're... Remember, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. <clears throat> so what happens is, if the person has been offended, and he doesn't do things God's way, he's now offended God in his approach to the offender. Uh, well, it also tells us in Ephesians to be kind, and in Matthew, of course, the golden rule that all of our parents taught us when we were growing up is, do unto others the way you would have others do unto you. So we need to think about that in our personal relationships with other people or businesses. Yeah. Um, so what we do is uh, if we handle it the wrong way, it's kind of like fireman. He goes to a house, he pulls up to in front of the house, it's on fire, he gets out his hose, he 
is doing everything right so far. He gets his hose out, and the hose is attached to a gasoline tanker. Uh, is that going to help the fire go out? No, it's going to make it worse. And so that's what happens when we circumvent God's method of dealing with, with offenses, dealing with people who's offenders. We're really making it worse. Are we using the proper channels, like hose, so forth? But as that verse of Walter said, Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you're speaking forth words that are like gasoline, you're just fueling the fire. So um, what we need to do is tamp down the fire, so to speak, um, and make sure that we aren't making it worse. Um, now, this isn't a blanket statement for everything, like you uh, like mentioned earlier, somebody in your family or somebody in your church or at work or whatever is being sexually offended in some way, maybe physically, sexually phys physically violated or something, or maybe even just uh, physically abused. You just can't go and say, oh, okay, well, uh, you know, I'll forgive you. Because the person's not going to be uh, able to just quit and say, okay, you know, I realize. They're going to go on and make more victims. And so ultimately, if you go down the chain and follow the, the offense trail, so to speak, and then uh, you could have stopped it. Or if uh, someone has financially uh, been offended by you, let's say if you work for a company and you embezzle, the company can't just simply say, oh, okay, well, uh, you can, uh, you know, we can understand. No, we got to uh, take take it to the next level. It's out of our hands. We have to deal with it. The fact that they uh, violated God's law, but also, as we mentioned before, is that uh, God's laws are incorporated into man's laws. Uh, and commandments says, "Thou shalt not steal." The books on uh, your states, the laws on your states uh, law books that says uh, you're not to steal. Rob, whatever. So my point is, uh, when you have these things happen that are such gross offense, offenses, then you have to take it to that next level where you take that person to a judge and jury and have them tried and, and uh, depends on the offense that may be executed. When Zacchaeus got saved and he had been um, an extortioning tax collector in the Bible, Jesus told him, of course, go and send him more, but also to restore many times um, more the money that he had extortion. Well, actually, uh, because he had gotten saved and really uh, understood things, uh, he understood the principle that there is a uh, restoration to be done. So he voluntarily did it, but he did it based on the fact that he knew what God's laws was. God uh, uh, didn't tell him verbatim, okay, you do this, but... Uh, because his heart was genuine and tender and those things, out of the abundance of the heart, now speaks. So Jesus uh, was able to make an impact in his life, and what he did, he said, you know, I've stolen from these people, so what I need to do is restore it back. And even more so, and gave him four times, you know. Uh, so, in, we read in Romans 13, 3 through 4. Romans 13, 3 through 4. I'll turn to that. And it says, um, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. For he is the minister of God for thee for good. But if thou do that which be a, uh, but if thou do that which is evil, or in other words, violate somebody, uh, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So this tells you that um, you know, we think of ministers, a minister of God, think of a pastor, priest, whatever. But the policeman, the judge, and so forth, they're ministers of God. So, and it says that um, they're not a terror to those that do good works. In other words, if you're, you're driving down the road doing the speed limit and like that, you're not going to get pulled over and, and the cop recommend you for doing the speed limit. Rarely would he call you, pull you over, and say, "Hey, you're doing a great job. Keep it up." <laughs> Never had that happen before. Uh, but what what you do is, if the guy's speeding down through there, doing like seventy, like I'll every once in a while, like watch these uh, actual live or then pre-recorded um, car chases. Pretty interesting. You know, the cop pulls him behind the guy, and he's you know, like, uh, 
And it's got seat belt violation. I've got a light busted out. And the guy's you know, really a felon. He stole the car and all like that. Um, so they take off on a high speed chase. Well, he fears the minister of God because he's done evil. That's what I'm saying. So when you are doing evil or offending somebody in a gross way, then these people, this minister of God in this instance, is there for your behalf. You, know, you just don't say, well, you know, he did this to me. I guess it was my fault. And all like that. No. You say, this wasn't my fault. And you're going to pay for it. You don't have to tell them that. They seem to do it just quietly go along your business. Uh, talk to the police. Uh, do a report. They turn it into the judge. And the guy gets to knock on the door. And, and he's called in for, uh, you know, why did you do this? His case is heard. Make sure that you didn't make it up. Um, and when the jury hears it, then that's how you uh, deal with offenses. Um, so God is then using these ministers, the police, magistrates, and so forth, um, as then able to execute vengeance for you against him or her. Uh, but, so that's the gross things that was, we was talking about uh, in the first session. But some of the petty things, you know, that after uh, confronting the offender, let's say he's, uh, I don't know, just whatever, maybe said something unkind to you. Uh, and so you address it and he doesn't hear you. He doesn't agree with you. He doesn't apologize. So what do you do? Uh, well, go back to Matthew 18. It says in verse 16, um, let's see, I guess if you have, okay, I've got that one. Um, so, <clears throat> Jesus gives the formula what to do with the second offense, not even the second refusal, the first refusal to hear what you have to say. You come with, him, uh, with a second approach. Uh, and Jesus said, but if he will not hear thee, then uh, take with thee one or two, uh, in other words, more people, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So notice you don't go to Facebook, you don't go here or there and tell everybody they're really. Uh, that's probably why, you know, when you think about it, a jury is supposed to be um, unbiased like that in the case of a make the jury. Uh, the judge, in a very bad case, like one time I was called up for jury duty, and uh, they asked me if I knew about the case. It was a case where a man and a woman was going to buy a car, and, and uh, they, they really uh, took the guy, taped him up in his face and all like that, put him in the trunk, and then killed him, put him in a freezer. It was really disgusting. And they asked me, they said, could you be able to try this case? You know, give this case. And so I said, uh, well, I know about it. And they said, well, you know anything about the case? And I said, well, I knew about it because, you know, I got a flash business, and we sell freezers. And of course, we fortunately didn't sell one, and then there's no okay on that. <laughs> but I said, uh, you know, I read about it, but I think I could, um, you know, hear the case and come to a you know, reasonable judgment. So they said, okay, uh, you're dismissed. <laughs> I mean, so what it is, I had heard about the case, so they probably thought, okay, you got unbiased, oh, you got a biased opinion about it. Um, and that's the way it is when you go around and tell everybody, tell everybody about your offense. They're already formulated an opinion. So, best thing to do, according to what uh, John Stormer was talking about in this section, um, you go to people who are, are not going to be like your rallying buddies and all like that, but you go to them and say, um, uh, this is what problem I have. You can go to people in the church. It's like the whole next level is you take two or three, uh, one or two people in the church. And you use people that are wise, discerning, uh, maybe un, unbiased, um, not maybe, but unbiased. Uh, you don't want to get somebody that has a uh, conflict of interest. You don't go to uh, maybe the deacon or a Sunday school teacher and, and uh, they actually work for the guy, whatever. Uh, so you let them hear the case. I mean, you. You take them with you and you explain again to the offender, um, Joe Blow, you said this to me and it was really, I think it was unkind. You're, um, you know, it's not just something petty, it's, uh, you know, like, you should get over it type thing. Uh, like, but, and you explain, he dialogues back and, and uh, he says, yeah, you're right, you know, I, I see my point now. And, or if he says, you know, look, I really meant what I said and, you know, no two ways about it. 
So then the two witnesses hear it. And so then now you as three witnesses. Uh, so it says that um, every word may be established. That way it's not he said, she said, but even in like all the way back in the Old Testament, uh, Moses said um, that you're not to hear an accusation against a person except for two witnesses. Uh, and in the same case was with Jesus, the Pharisees uh, credit. Uh, they asked what uh, you know, we have uh, these charges against Jesus, you know, who can uh, validate these charges? Nobody can do it. They can have two witnesses. In other words, it's important to have two witnesses. Uh, one, at least, and you makes two. Or two witnesses, with you makes three. Um, so, basically, uh, when you have someone that's discerning and so forth, takes this information, then you can actually uh, come up with a right. Okay. We're understanding that this guy's really being hard enough about this. So if after not deciding to change, uh, the offender would not hear the two or three witnesses and repent, then the matter is presented before the whole church. You know, you don't have a whole lot of that nowadays. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure that there's one guy that was uh, dealt with with church discipline. Technically, he should have been dealt with by going to the police. The church should have, uh, based on the offense. Um, but uh, you take these matters to the church. Let's say if you got someone who's a leader in the church, I mean, you have to be a leader, just a member, um, and you come in as a member agreeing to Bible principles and so forth, and this guy here is not uh, willing to repent after one admonition, after two admonitions, so then you bring him before the church and say, this is what we have, Joe Blow said this and that, and he's just uh, not only haven't said that, which was uh, not kind, Offensive, but now he's actually violated the word of God in that he refuses to uh, make amends and make things right and apologize. Uh, so then <clears throat> it says in Matthew uh, 18 17, it says, And if he shall neglect to hear them, in other words, the church body, uh, uh, in other words, uh, if he shall neglect to hear them, uh, initially the first uh, three weeks. You and the two other ones. Uh, tell it to the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Um, so if he, you go through these steps, and if he still doesn't want to change, then you just put him out of church. He can't be someone in there. It's like having a cancer cell in the body. You don't want to sit there and say, oh, okay, that's, that's a nice little color there. It's a nice little diversity. I'm a white guy with a nice, you know, Asymmetrical shape on my body that's you know, different colors, uh, abstract, you know, like abstract art. No, you want to take it out. And with a person who is offensive and, and uh, prideful and that type of thing, you want to get rid of them. Um, not for the purpose so much as to, like, okay, we got one up on you, but hopefully the guy will, in time, by being put out, uh, be isolated, so to speak, and the Spirit of God can work in him. And be restored. <coughs> um, so when done properly, the two sides will be more successful uh, in this attempt to reaching the offender. But if these steps are left off, then both sides will be hurt. There'll be sides drawn. We've seen that, heard that in the case of the churches and so forth. Um, and then uh, feelings are hurt. Churches split, and you got both of them basically are. Um, out of God's will then, because if you're not doing things God's way, then both of them are, are out of God's will. So you've got a church split, and they're bad. A church split here, they're remaining a uh, church congregation. Then. So uh, they're not being able to be Holy Spirit filled, um, holding animosity against God's word. So um, it's like when you put a fire out in the house, um, in the environment, you don't get the fire's gone. Uh, you get rid of the guy, but if you get still like, ill feelings or there's a split, you still got ill feelings. Like it's like this house that recently actually burned down in Greenville, where the uh, firemen went out, put the house in, uh, fire out. Apparently, it had minimal structural damage, I guess. Um, so the man and his wife, uh, I think they were out of town or something, <clears throat> and so 
while they were waiting, their son and his girlfriend came in and they spent the night there uh, and didn't know that there was smoldering um, embers in the house. The house rekindled and burned down, killing them, both of them. So that's the problem when you have problems unresolved. It seems fine on the surface, but it's smoldering. Um, we don't want that in relationships. Um, so unforgiveness between two people no, is no different. Unforgiveness is the match that ignites the fuel that destroys people's lives. Uh, so lastly, in the Isaiah 53, 6, we see uh, that we're told that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one his own way. So we, uh, we have many verses in the scriptures that shows this. But uh, the fact is, we have offended God. And so we believe we go about our day, and oh, okay, there's no God, or, uh, well, God's a grandfather, he just passes on head, says, you know, you can violate my law, you can live with your significant other, you can have same sex, you can have any anything you want, and be drunk, and come to church the next day, and all like that, and, and come as you are, and go as you are, you know, well, I, you're, all, you're fine. You know. I'm a loving God, and, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, if you offend God, He is just and holy to deal with sin. Uh, there's, so, the fact is that we've offended God, and secondly, uh, and the Bible calls this sin. You know, people nowadays, they get offended and get sued, and all that, because their lifestyle, or whatever, like that, they're called, He called me a sinner. Uh, I just think it's love. Uh, well, we need to love God and hate our sin. Uh, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, we can't think that I'm above this person or whatever. We're all sinned. We're all on the same level playing field. God's here, high and holy, <clears throat> just, and if he killed us all and sent us to hell, he's just. I mean, uh, because he's the judge. And if we're going to offend him, we're not going to get by our little works, as it says there in Isaiah, that all our works are just like filthy rags. You know, basically, the best we can do is like, still worse. Um, so, um, when we have sinned and come short of the glory of God, is there any hope? I say, well, you know, if my works can't save me, and God's anger with me, I guess I'll just keep sinning. You know, there's just nothing else I can do. Because uh, I'm just going to have to live it up now, so that way I can or when I'm in hell, you know, reflect back to the good times again. But no, um, what we need to do is we need to see that we got to repent. Um, God is just and holy, like I said, to, uh, with his anger and disgust of our sin, to put us in hell. But even though he's holy and just, he will uh, exercise mercy over his wrath. I mean, look at Nineveh uh, as an example. So, God will exercise his mercy, but he'll not always uh, do that for us. So we have a little window of time there. Sometimes God gives us one chance. Sometimes he gives us multiple. Uh, but we don't want to waste away our chances <clears throat> for his mercy. Um, so if we remember back to Matthew 18, uh, 16, that uh, if we confess that we've done wrong, and in this case, we're the offender and God is the one that's offended, if we confess that we uh, uh, offended God and agree with Him, then uh, He will um, forgive us and then not be putting us away in our darkness and punishment. Um, but if we don't repent, then He puts us out and uh, and to that darkness and the eternal flames and all like that and uh, declares us as heathen. That is if we die in that state. Um, but Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin, you go to work a job, you're going to work, uh, say, 40 hours a week, 32 hours, whatever somebody might offer you. So you work at the end of the week and then you, you go to the boss and say, okay, well, uh, payday, the wages of working a life of 
sin in it is payday. It's called death. So um, when you do that, life of sin, there's no hope. You get a payday with death. Uh, but the second half of the verse is good news. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus took our payday for death. He died on the cross, paid for our sins. The way of sin is death. He took away death's sting. When we repent of our sins and call on Christ, then we are given this new life. We're given restoration, reconciliation, and then being able to be filled with the Spirit of God um, and live for Him. So you might be thinking, okay, uh, okay, God, well, I'm, I agree with you that I'm a bad person. And you go away and just kind of, okay, I did that. Well, unless you do something more than that, you're still just offending God by your sin. Um, so, what do you have to do in order to, to be made right with God? Uh, what Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, Luke 13, 3, uh, he says, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. If you don't repent, agree with God, and repent of those things that have offended God through your actions, then um, you shall perish. Uh, so, repent, uh, agreeing with God, and repenting, and then, then you uh, shall escape the perishing. And uh, 1 John 5, 14, uh, we have this great promise, which basically tells us, John says, and this is the confidence that we have in Jesus, that if we ask anything according to his will, uh, he hears us. So you're thinking, well, oh, God's way out there, and you know, I can't see him and all that. But this verse here, you know, does away with all that. He says, if you ask anything according to his will, he hears you. Um, and then Second Peter 3 9, you might be thinking, um, well, how do I know what his will is for me to talk to him about? And Second Peter 3 9 says uh, that uh, he is not, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, okay, God's will is that he doesn't want you to die in your sins, and his will is for you to repent. So, if you pray and ask God to uh, forgive you of your sins, you agree with him that you're a sinner, and you receive his forgiveness, that's his will. He doesn't want you to uh, die and perish outside his uh, presence and for all eternity. So the question today is, uh, do you want to continue in this lifestyle of offending God? Um, or are you going to say, I'm sorry for my sins, and repent of that, and then believe that Jesus paid for your sins' death? And so uh, what we'll do is uh, 